Hi, we're now going to consider the first phase of four in our project lifecycle initiation. So we'll look at what occurs during this phase, what the inputs and outputs are to this phase, and what are some common constraints which feed in to this phase. So first of all, initiation is our first phase of four. So we start with initiation, we go to planning, then execution, then evaluation. But during initiation is where we consider the need for and the purpose of our project. So why are we doing this? and what is the intended goal of this project. So what are the goals? What's the end product going to be? Are we going to make something in this project? Are we going to deliver some infrastructure, some service? What are we doing in this project? What is going on? What people do we need and other resources to complete the project? So a resource is anything we need to complete the project. So money, personnel, staff, uh, materials, expertise, etc. So what do we need to complete the project is really important. What the time scale is going to be and is it realistic? Is it possible for us to even do this project in time or at all? Have we got the skills in our staff to do it? If not, we might need to stop. We will start this phase with a list of user requirements and also some user constraints. So we'll talk a bit more about both of these in a minute. But Both of these are inputs to this phase. That's assuming we are a project manager and we have got some client. So a client is providing us with both of these things. If you are an entrepreneur and you're starting your own project from scratch, you may have to come up with these yourselves. But let's assume for the time being someone else is paying us to do this project. We are given the requirements and also the constraints from a client. The main task of this phase is for us or really the project manager to produce a feasibility report. So a feasibility report is our kind of key task in initiation and this is considering all of the factors involved so all of the stuff up here really and to propose a way forward and to decide really if there is a way forward sometimes you'll start a project and realize straight away during initiation but actually in its current form you just can't do it so you may as well stop and try and change some of the constraints and requirements to make it more possible that's really going to be encapsulated inside a feasibility report but we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but for the time being, we can just consider it being an output from this phase. Just to try and tie some of our theory to an actual example from real life. So Crossrail is currently the largest infrastructure project in Europe at the time of recording. So a massive, massive project, not strictly IT only, right? It's building actual tunnels, stations, new trains. So the idea is it's connecting London, going across London, hence the name and adding a whole new tube line called the Elizabeth Line to the London underground map. So it's a massive, massive project, not strictly IT, you know, it's building the tunnels, the stations, the trains are not IT necessarily, but there's a massive IT aspect to it. All the signaling, all the connections, all the control systems are all going to be IT infrastructure. But the initiation part of this came when it was given essentially permission to start. So initiation, the word initiate is starting something. So when Crossrail was given the green light by Parliament, is where Parliament effectively says you can do this, it gives it permission to do it. Obviously building a massive new train line requires the government to give permission and Parliament more generally. So it's giving us, of a Parliament are giving a budget, 15.9 billion, so a huge amount of money, and it outlines why it's doing it. So that's what initiation is, it's effectively deciding if it's possible, and if it is possible, what are the constraints, what are the requirements for the project. Right, going back to the theory, if we talk a bit more about the inputs first of all. So I mentioned we've got two, user requirements and constraints. Requirements first of all, as I say, if you're working for a client, someone's paying you to do the project for them, they're going to give you some user requirements always, pretty much. So it's likely, I mean really, why would they not? Because they define what the client wants you to achieve. If they're just giving you a blank check and saying, spend what you want, do what you want, that's not really a project. So they're going to give you some requirements, some list of what they want to achieve with their project. So for example, it could be a little bit vague, they could be something like buy every teacher in the school a suitable tablet computer that they can use in lessons. It's fairly vague, suitable, what does that really mean? What do they mean by suitable? Maybe that's left up to you to decide, maybe you're going to want to go back and iterate and ask them again, what do they really mean by suitable? But that could be a requirement. It could be something like the homepage of websites should have a grey coloured menu bar with links to an about us section. So more specific than our previous one, different projects obviously, more specific. This is telling us exactly what the client wants us to achieve, but perhaps some decisions are still being left to us. 
you know, how big is this menu bar going to be, what other links are there going to be on this menu, etc. Right? So some decisions may be left to us, some might be really clearly defined in a user requirements document. So we get given a list of what they want to achieve, they'll also give us a list of things they don't want to happen. So these are constraints. So a constraint is a limitation that we must comply with. So they're telling us we can't do something or we can't go beyond a certain number. That's what we have to do as well as following our requirements. So for example, we have different types of constraints. You kind of have to learn these different types essentially. So our first, perhaps most obvious one is time. So a time constraint is where it tells us, where the client tells us it has to be completed by a set date. So if a clear date, we must complete the project by. Otherwise, they'll just be unlimited. You could just say, okay, complete the project whenever you want to. We want to have a clear, defined time scale involved. A second fairly obvious example is a constraint regarding your resources. So resources, as I said earlier, is any anything you need to create your project. So your staff numbers, your budget, any other physical resources you need, like concrete or bricks, if it's that kind of project, or wires or hardware. So budget-wise is perhaps the most obvious. So for example, you'll get given a budget, so you can't spend more than £100,000 maybe. Crossrail is billions of pounds, so much, much more. Again, this is still quite a big project, 100000 But we can't go beyond that. And often your deadline might be quite flexible. Occasionally it might be quite flexible, but budget often isn't because the person paying you has only got so much money to spend. You also often have to comply with certain regulations. So this includes laws, but also industry specific standards. But laws are a bit easier to understand, so we'll take that. So for example, GDPR is a massive European law regarding data protection. You would have hopefully learned in LO4, or we will look at it in those videos. But essentially, we need to comply with the law, otherwise we're going to break it. Even if you are not in Europe, even if GDPR does not apply to you, you still may be asked to comply with it in case the business wants to expand into Europe. Say you are in Asia or America, you might still want to be compliant with the European law just so you can work in that country in the future or in that continent in the future. You'll also often have a security constraint, so all clients are going to want their system to be secure. Maybe some are more secure than others. So a school would want some security for their tablets, but the government would want even more security for their IT systems. So for example, quite a vague constraint here really, but we might want your system to be secure against malware, so maybe you've got one a firewall or some antivirus software. We want some way of protecting against a threat. Again, this is LO4 really, but um, that could be a constraint. Also finally, mitigation of risks. So mitigation is about reducing something, so reducing risks. And this is quite vague again, but could well be about some future, some future thing the client foresees. So for example, they might want you to make a system which is forward compatible. Forward compatible means that it's gonna work in the future, essentially. It's gonna be compatible, it's gonna work with future products. So for example, Crossrail, that train system, maybe the government want you to ensure it still works with the future trains that have been developed. So it's not just gonna stop working in five years time, they want it to be future proof and still work in the future. A risk could be, the risk there is that it's not gonna work. So they're trying to mitigate that, trying to reduce that risk by ensuring it's gonna work with future systems too. Using the keyword mitigation again, but more generally this time, thinking about how we can mitigate against the constraints. We've said up here that we can't we can't break these constraints. If we break them, some of them might be a little bit flexible, but most of them are gonna be quite serious if we break them. We may, we may not get paid, we may lose our jobs. We have to meet these constraints because they're said for a reason. So mitigation against the constraints is how we are going to adapt as a project manager to ensure that we aren't breaking the constraint. So this is very specific to what the constraint is and the case study. But for example, if we are ensuring we've already completed by January, we're gonna map out the exact time scale before January, have milestones, maybe have a Gantt chart to clearly show what we need to do before that January deadline. If we've got a budget of no more than 100,000, we might limit the number of staff we're going to employ. Maybe only employ, say, five members of staff as opposed to 50, because 50 is gonna take us over that budget for example. So it's quite specific, but how are we going to adapt to ensure that we aren't going to break any of these constraints is what constraint mitigation is. So we've discussed the inputs to initiation, the constraints and also the requirements, but in terms of what actually goes on during initiation, we have to talk about what's going on between the inputs and the outputs. So this is the first line of our table I showed you in the first video, which shows us all of the inputs and outputs for our four phases. So we've got our inputs, we discussed what these are already. 
Now let's look at our outputs and what goes on during the phase. So as part of initiation, we also need to consider the legislation implications as part of this phase. So legislation is effectively a law. So what laws are relevant to your project is what legislation implications is a fancy way of saying effectively. So laws, again, is an LO4 topic, which we'll come on to, but you may know certain laws already. But looking at examples, there are, I'd say, two main ones which are most likely to come up. So first of all, if you are, say, creating a website as your product in your project, you'll need to consider the Copyrights, Designs and Patents Act of 1988. This is what tells us who owns certain intellectual property, so things like pictures, things like text, so you can't just steal a picture in your new website. You've got to have the appropriate permissions of the photographer or the artist. You've got to get permission because this law says you need to. You'd write about that during this part of the initiation. Another example, another law, say you are collecting some user data, maybe as part of your website, maybe not. You'll need to consider what you can and can't store, which is really based on the Data Protection Act of 2018, also GDPR. You are looking at that law and that law will tell you what you can and can't do, what is illegal, what is legal, and you'll use that interpretation to discuss what the implications are for your project. So for example, maybe you are collecting user data about healthcare. So based on the Data Protection Act, you can't collect sensitive medical data without their permission and you can't store it in another country, for example, based on this law. So you've got to be quite careful and it's a good idea to consider it in, in initiation as opposed to after you've made your product and maybe you realise your product is actually illegal based on these laws. Alongside the legislation implications, another really important output from the initiation, so another task, is a feasibility report. This is done usually by the project manager in conjunction with other staff potentially. And the word feasible, in case you're not sure what that means, feasible is about how possible something is. So is something possible, is it feasible? Feasibility, how possible something is. So as you'd expect from a definition, the feasibility report is evaluating how realistic the project is. Is this whole project going to be possible? If it's not possible, let's just stop now or revise something. Let's not continue into the next few phases without evaluating how feasible it is first. So as part of this report, Lots of different questions will be answered based on this kind of theme. So can we meet our requirements outlined by the client despite the constraints? So for example, have they given enough, enough money to fulfill their requirements? Have we got enough staff? Is it even possible? Are they clear enough? That's another one. Can we meet the requirements without having broken any laws? So based on our legislation implications, we'll know what laws are relevant. Can we do this project without breaking them? Or are we going to have to change some of our requirements or just abort the whole idea, first of all? And also, are there any better options? Are there not any better options? What else is available? So right now, we've got some idea of how we're going to approach this project, some initial idea, not the fully formed plan yet. But we've got some idea. Are there better options? Are we the best person to make this project? This is really important to consider this now before we've spent loads of money planning it and actually doing the project. We want to consider it at the earliest opportunity. We can think about what other alternatives are available and why is this idea, why is this project the best one available? So beyond the couple we've looked at so far, there are two other tasks done in every single initiation. The first of which is setting objectives, which we'll leave until the next video just for the sake of time. And it's quite a big chunk of content as well. But we also will end, as we end of every phase, with a phase review done by the project manager. So in a in a meeting, in a presentation, in a document maybe. So a review is looking back, I meaning we've got to have done the other tasks first. That's the last one we do. And this is effectively looking at what's been done, what we can improve in the future, deciding whether or not we should continue. So looking at the next steps, is it worth continuing into the planning phase? If not, we're going to iterate. So. Specifically for initiation, it's going to discuss whether a feasibility report actually found that it's possible. So maybe this report decides that it's not feasible. Maybe there's a better option available. Now, during the review, we'll look at that and go, OK, I better change what we're doing. Let's not move on without having addressed the concerns in this report. We will also look at how effective our legislation implications section was. Was that done by a specialist or do we need to hire a lawyer next time maybe who weren't fully considered maybe we're not quite sure 
what the implications are. We might have to do that again, or maybe it's fine, maybe we can move forward. And also we'll look at how sufficient the requirements and the constraints are. So those were the inputs. Perhaps they are quite vague and quite unclear. We might need to go back and get new ones or ask for clarification from the client. Having looked at these, if they are all fine, we're gonna move on to the next phase, which is planning. If not, we might have to make some changes and iterate. So repeat some task, whichever one was the issue, repeat it, do it better, and then we can move on after this until the next phase. We wanna make sure everything is perfect before we move on because these outputs are gonna form the input to planning and planning is not gonna go well unless we've done these properly.